Yeah, I think it works with Linux. Let's take a look. Yeah. I'll just this one's pretty simple, and then I set the videos to um, play out. Uh, some of them, the full screen one, the full screen ones I said. It might be a little bit of a mix, actually, but in any case, uh, because we're in presenter view, you, you should be able to always click through this. We're in presenter view. So if we're in presenter view, let's go to a slide with predict. Oh, with speaker notes. Uh, oh, here, yeah, you can. They should show up. Do you remember which one you have notes for? Uh, it's, it's not It's not quite notes. It's like, there you go. If, for example, we want to show the yeah. oh, like you, if you have multiple videos. Yeah, if I have multiple videos, sorry, I'm trying to <laughs> think. I think on the slides with multiple videos, I set them all to autoplay. But I yeah, that's what you want. That, that's probably not what I want. It's fine. If they autoplay, then they just autoplay. And I can do it. Other, otherwise, so, if, they, so, if they don't autoplay, when you click, it'll play them one by one, is the way it works. And if I want to jump around, um, you should, let's see, there should be a different view. If you click here, um, you can go. You can jump. You can jump from there. So let's see. We have. Oh, your thing. Okay, so I could just come up here and play the one by one. Oh, no, no, no. Let's see, can I? So I definitely set these all to autoplay, which I can undo. Oh, actually, you can. You can. You can. I can't click, click it on. It's just yeah. Gonna show up. Yep. Is, so is this okay? Yeah. That, 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 that. Cool. The problem when you don't use presenter view with full screen videos is it can be really hard to advance. I discovered, and you're clicking like twenty times trying to get it to advance. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, was, I forget which slide. That was not a hundred percent. But well, whatever. I'm basically going to hand it over once we start talking about the detail of the station. So I'll sort of introduce yeah. stuff, and then you'll kind of take over as we dive. So we have 20 minutes left. I'll aim to take about 10, and then 10 minutes left. I can, you know, adjust it like it was. This is a message from Catherine Nutter, MD, at SMG Women Health at St. Louis. So much dead space. <laughs> yeah, this, this building's here. Really, really you really could have another, <laughs> have another lab up there. Like, perfect for higher speed. I guess it's not. It's not quite convex. Yeah. All right, what's it want? Yes, maybe it's never coming back now. Okay, all right, everybody, uh, we're going to get started. Welcome to the last DI seminar of the term. 
Uh, so today we have Ben Birchfield and Siwan Feng, who are um, from Toyota Research Institute, where uh, I believe Ben is a manager and Siwan is a research staff scientist. Um, I so, <laughs> so Ben uh, did his PhD at uh, Duke at the Intelligent Robotic, in, uh, I'm sorry, Intelligent Robot Lab, where uh, he worked on 3D perception, learning from demonstration, and multimodal vision language present, uh, representations. And uh, Siwan uh, did his PhD at CMU, where he worked on bipedal uh, robot walking, uh, where you know he went on the DARPA Robotics Challenge, the same challenge that Russ went on a couple of years ago. Uh, so Ben and Siwan are both very interested in uh, making general purpose robots with scalable approach to data. And today we're gonna hear from them about their um, attempt to scale up. Start with the round of applause. Awesome. Thank you, Terry. Um, it's great to be here. So um, essentially, uh, we're both part of a group that's working towards making, you know, general purpose embodied intelligence a reality. And, you know, as you can see by the title of the talk, uh, that isn't the case today. I think it remains very much a North Star, but there's been a lot of technical progress over the last couple of years that has taken this from sort of a long term aspirational goal to something that feels like it's actually concretely within reach. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we're trying to hit that goal, where things are now, and what the critical challenges that are left that we need to overcome are. So for those of you especially who attended Coral, I think um, you'll be very kind of familiar with, with the, the recent discussion about is scale enough or where are we with scale? And there's been, I think, a fair amount of conversation lately about is scale all you need? Is, you know, is the only thing left to scale? And we sort of solved embodied intelligence. And I don't know. Uh, and I think moreover, that's probably not the right question right now. I think in, instead the question uh, that we've been thinking about a lot is do we need scale? And I'm here to argue to you all that that one at least is much more easily decidable that yes, we do. I don't see a clear path towards reasonable embodied intelligence without scale being a critical component. There's an open question about whether scale solves all problems most problems, you know, maybe just a couple of problems, but I think right now the landscape is pretty murky. When you're doing small scale experiments, it's really not clear what, what problems are actually fundamentally hard and which problems go away pretty quickly as, as you start to lean into more data and larger data driven methods. So I think for people that are excited about scale and wanna see where that can take them, it's an exciting time, definitely scale. And for people that don't wanna do that work and wanna do things that are, you know, maybe more structure based or, or, or kind of come at it from another direction, you still need to be working in a regime with scale so that you can see which problems aren't trivially solved and hit things that are still going to be bottlenecks for more than, you know, let's say just the next year. So the, the goal basically kind of when do we say, OK, we've we've done this thing, we have embodied intelligence. Um, is something like a foundation model for general purpose robots. And I would argue that that doesn't require perfect robots, doesn't even require superhuman performance. Instead, it means that we get abilities in embodied agents that are similar to some of what we're seeing now in, for instance, language models. So that means that we get the sorts of generalization you'd see. So you can take concepts from different parts of your training data and you can compose them. It means that you have the ability to learn from one example or even no examples. So like zero shot learning. It means that you get notions of emergent like common sense. So similar to how a language model generally will respond in you know, reasonably complete sentences with proper grammar, you want an embodied agent that behaves in a reasonable, natural and safe way, even when it's doing something new and you know, even when it's failing. So don't fail catastrophically. Um, and finally, I think for, for robots in particular, uh, there's a notion of generalizing across hardware that's important. And this is somewhat distinct from the language setting where assuming that you're in the same language, everybody's you know, computer, everybody's environment is basically the same. We have this extra twist with robots where you actually need a model that we can apply. You know, you've changed the gripper, it still works. You've changed your sensors, it still works. Maybe you add an extra degree of freedom to the robot, you don't have to start from scratch. And the, the use case for this, I think in, in many ways will be similar to how we interact with language models and VLMs today. We can ask requests of the robot, for instance, in natural language, there's other ways to do it too. And you have some reasonable expectation that it, it's you know, going to perform that, that behavior, maybe not successfully, 
but in a not sort of pathologically unpredictable way. So we've been calling these things large behavior models. You'll hear other people refer to them as embodied intelligence or embodied foundation models. Um, the reason that I like talking about large behavior models is I think it makes it a little bit more concrete what we're going for. So you don't necessarily need AGI to get a lot of these capabilities that we care about. Instead, you just need some of the generalization that we've seen in other large models. And this, I think, helps give us a concrete North Star and also a nice way to think about pulling solutions from other parts of machine learning where we're a little bit farther along in the scaling process. And really, I think where the whole field is right now is finding proof of life. So getting these first large models that start to show some of these properties. And then we need to understand how they scale, not just in terms of compute, which I think is what, what many people think about, but also in terms of these data trade-offs. Like embodied data in particular is, is expensive and we don't have an internet full of it right now. We need to go gather it ourselves. So with some data budget, how do we balance diversity? How do we balance quality? You know, if you have a human demonstrator, for instance, if they slow down, they could probably get higher quality data, but at the cost of less throughput. And there isn't a good understanding right now of how to balance each of these factors. So a little bit about us. Um, so Toyota Research Institute is a center that does applied research, solving sort of foundational fundamental problems that can improve humanity. In our case, we work on technology to fix um, essentially, you know, the aging population issue, um, issues of sort of lack of, of people to perform stuff, or even issues of um, you need assistance. You know, say you have a, a physical limitation. Um, we think a lot about elder care, for instance. And so people that maybe need a little bit of help around the house, but still want to stay autonomous. We work at the intersection between those applications and then where the fundamental sort of limits of the field are. So we try to push in fundamental places in the, in the sort of research landscape that we think will be critical path to unlocking some of these applications. And you know, it's our belief that sort of general purpose behavior is almost certainly critical path to putting a robot you know, in someone's house and making it actually adaptable and practical enough that they can use it in the ways that they would need to to support this kind of paradigm. So, this is what our Cambridge lab looks like. Um, these days, we have a pretty healthy fleet of robots going. Um, in particular, we focus a lot on uh, by manual manipulation and dexterous manipulation. And, and when I say that, I mean, in particular, interesting interactions that are beyond simple sort of reorientation with rigid objects. So we don't necessarily always use dexterous fingers. In fact, most of our work is, is parallel grippers. But when I say dexterous, I really mean manipulation that is beyond just moving rigid things through space. So recently, we've been doing a lot of supervised learning. And in fact, all of this talk is going to talk about our efforts in that area. So the setup for pretty much everything we're going to talk about is this. We have some human demonstrations using a teleop device. And those demonstrators will control the robot to perform some, some task. And we tend to make very few sort of object-centric or, or structural assumptions. So we can handle deformables. Um, we can handle articulation, we can handle, you know, non-solids non pretty easily. And we'll collect a set of these demonstrations for something we'd like the robot to do, usually on the order of you know, 50 to, to maybe low hundreds. And the result, we, we train this in a, in a supervised behavior cloning way, the result looks something like this. And recently we've been doing a lot of diffusion policy work, which we'll get into in a little bit. But the, the high level version is that I think there's been very exciting algorithmic advances in the field in the last year and a half or so that has really unlocked this as a thing that we can now do reliably without having to go back and do a lot of parameter tuning and a lot of task specific tweaking. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna ha hand it over to my colleague Siwan. We'll do a little bit of a deep dive into how we teach single skills and of where the field is, what works, what doesn't work, some of the hardware considerations. And then in the second part of the talk, we'll talk about moving beyond teaching one task at a time, what it looks like to be learning multiple behaviors jointly, and how that, you know, we see that leading to these true large behavior models that have these properties that we've, we'd like to see. Thanks. So um, this is again, a, a sort of a, a paranormal, a panorama of what the lab looks like currently. Um, and right now we're counting uh, six dual arm panda stations in the lab. Um, about half of them is, are, are being used for uh, more dedicated data collections uh, from day to day. And some of them 
a subset of them are sort of haptics enabled. So the, the fancy, you know, uh, sort of matrix movie of tally up devices, what we're referring to here. Um, uh, and, and the rest of the stations are controlled through space mouses. Uh, they're kind of like a, a 3D uh, positional input device. So just to give you a sense of what we have been collect data collecting so far, uh, these are a few examples of data from uh, somewhere later half of November till last week. Um, as you can see, we're working mostly in the sort of kitchen domain. A lot of the tasks we're working on are food related. Some of them are human tool related. Um, so for example, if you look at the first, these two examples, um, this one uh, is pulling a bag of green leaves and dumping them into a salad bowl. And uh, the overall task here were, uh, is trying to teach the robot how to prepare a salad for us. This is part of it, dumping the leaves into it. And if you look at this one, this is kind of a, a pouring dressing from a espresso cup. That's kind of weird, but that's, that's, that's how we're doing the, the dressing part now. As you can see the, the demonstrators, you know, we tell them basically uh, pour dressings on. We didn't specify how the motions, we didn't specify exactly how you arrange things. And this is like leaving a lot of the uh, space uh, up to different people for creativity and also for diversity uh, for the data. This is an example for cutting um, a cucumber. You know, we're, we're using a not, you know, cutting friendly knife. This is a pretty blunt sort of uh, chopper thing. and. The reliable way to cut with this tool is you do a little bit of this uh, sawing motion. And this is being hard on the robot. And if you do this rock back and forth motion, it's actually a very reliable strategy. That's also something people discover as they demonstrate these things. Um, here's an example of spreading uh, unspeakable things. In this case, probably just chocolate on, on, uh, on a piece of bread. Uh, again, with a, a very a human uh, everyday life tool. This is this is one example of the, the, the tactile sensors we have been using. This, the, the same idea, mostly same idea behind, uh, for example, gel set. In this particular task, um, the robot is trying to uh, tighten the bottle cap. Um, so this is the bubble image sensor. And the bubble is sitting here. So the robot is turning the the, the Auto cap with this bubble, um, and the way to tell uh, your the bottle is is fastened is you can visibly see a more shear from the bubble sensor, and that's what the policy is able to pick up later on. This is kind of an interesting example of uh, um, what our taxol sensors looks like, and and this is more like a totally oddball thing, you know. Uh, handheld vacuum, the robot actually, you know, flips a switch, turns it on, and then vacuums. What is this pinto beans? It's some beans off the table. Um, and, uh, you know, when, when I think this is, this is Eric, who, who is our sort of expert demonstrator at this point. Um, and then when he's done with this task, he turns the vacuum off, right? And actually dumps everything into this bowl. This is a, this is kind of like the everyday fun part of uh, a lot of the uh, the, the data collect part. All right. How is it going to actually fall? Um... Oops. Oh, I should probably go back here. Okay. So this is what our robot station looks like. Um, it's basically two panda arms uh, bolted on our custom built modular uh, robot cells, we call them. So for each of our dual arm stations, it has uh, three cells essentially. One holds the table, two holds individual arms. The arms are basically on passive XY plotters and the tables can be lowered up and down. So it's you know a way to get some diversity in terms of kinematics there. Uh, in terms of sensing, we're not doing super uh, super duper, you know, fancy at this point, uh, mostly just real sensors. So we have two for scene cameras, two for risk cameras. Uh, we didn't have risk cameras for a long time, but after we have been putting risk cameras, we've actually seen a very significant improvement in terms of policy performance. So 
So that, that has been a, a critical uh, thing that he discovered along the ways. And in terms of uh, input devices, so these are red circles. Uh, they're not as uh, common as dependent arms, I guess. So the two big things at the left and right are the haptic and haptic devices. So we can feel the forces from uh, these robots are uh, in the, uh, the, 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 the haptics is basically uh, done through a positional force uh, coupling between the appendage arms and the haptic devices. So essentially we're commanding, um, we're commanding torques to the robot um, and the, the robot is giving us the, the sort of sense external torque and that's mapped back to the haptic device um, and projected on the, on the operators. Uh, also, we added foot pedals. They, they turn out to be very critical aspect and sort of a very huge quality of life improvement for uh, the data collection process. So you don't have to, you know, do this and then go fumble and try to find your controller, you know, Xbox controller and press some keys on that. Cool. All right. Um, we we do have simulation. You know, Drake is. A large part of actually Drake is sort of the pedestal for a lot of the things, especially controls and planning side. What we do, um, this is just to show you uh, the current state of simulations. Um, and because we're doing a lot of learning uh, policy, uh, sort of learn policy work nowadays, uh, rendering quality has been. Has been. Uh, rendering has been a question that we just keeps getting asking over and over and over. So on the on the right, this is uh, Drake simulation, but rendered through Blender, um, just to give you a sense of uh, what is possible uh, in terms of rendering quality for Drake. Okay, so uh, numbers, right? So we're talking about scaling up data collection, and this is roughly uh, what we have been getting for the trend. Uh, so the vertical bar is roughly speaking where we have really, you know. Uh, press the gas pedal and, and added more fleets to the robot, added more people to collect the data. Um, and you, know, you can see uh, we, we're getting a significant boost in terms of uh, uh, the throughput, the data collection throughput here. Our goal is to uh, collect roughly on the order of 1K scales by next year. Uh, right now we're sitting around like 120-ish as of uh, I think yesterday. Cool. So um, now I'm going to just go a little bit deeper, I think, into some of the, the actual uh, the policy learning side of it, like what, what it makes everything possible here, or a, a component uh, that makes everything possible here. And uh, um, so I think Yuan is here as well. <laughs> so uh, a lot of our work from last year was uh, centered around using diffusion policies. Uh, it is a you know, it, is, it has been a very good uh, general recipe for cloning behavior, for behavior cloning to generate uh, skills for us. The, the rough idea is, is essentially we, it's sort of taking, the analogy is, you know, we, we take the image diffusion example, uh, but instead of generating images, uh, we're generating robot actions. So uh, just to give you a little bit, Detail. Everything here, mostly all the details are, are encapsulated in the uh, in the paper very well, and also in our medium blog post. Um, so, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna sort of blitz throughout these. The important details: um, uh, we're not generating uh, uh, states; we're generating just the actions. The observations are fed as as, as a conditioning uh, instead of a state. Did that in the, the sort of uh, speed up inference and also training. That was one of the um, main trade-offs we had to do. But um, uh, and in, in this case, we're using a, a 1D unit uh, architecture to, uh, to do the diffusion part. All right. Cool. So here are some more uh, newer videos that we have prepared for Coral. Uh, in, a, in a live demonstration. So, so here the task is to essentially unroll this uh, silicone mat um, from a rolled up state into you know, unrolled and then kind of align it with the table. Um, so 
But I think this scale is cloned with around 200 demonstrations. Um, so this is the nominal execution. I think Eric is going to soon uh, try to inject uh, a little bit of perturbations. And uh, so one thing interesting here is the, the, the robot is able to do this with both arms. The, 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 the mat was rolled in one particular direction in the previous run. And this time, uh, Eric purposefully did it uh, and found the other direction as well. Eric's going to do it again with a more uh, carefully, not carefully, but you know, definitely rolled up um, mat. And also, he's trying to showcase uh, we can put the mat down with a little bit, you know, different yaw angles, and the robot is still able to do it. I think towards the end, it has a little bit more interesting uh, failure point. Uh, or, or no, maybe not. Okay, so this is what roughly we can do. Here's just a mosaic of um, videos we have been uh, putting on the YouTube, I think, uh, and also in the Medium blog post. This is, uh, we can pour stuff uh, from containers, we can load dishes, we can spread peanut butter on toast. We can beat eggs. Uh, this is a flip pancake example. Um, here is, is my personal favorite, actually. Um, this is the robot flipping a book with the bubble sensor. And it's trained to flip to a, a specific page, which is that salad page. And so you see Naveen just flip um, a couple more pages uh, to the front, and the robot knows how to flip it back. Um, and here the robot is doing this once, and it's going to just keep doing it. OK. Um, this is sort of a plug for why we think we're, we're so into tactile sensing. Um, uh, we don't quite fully understand all the details just yet. But if we just look at the performance of these policies rolled out, the, we do see a very big improvement in terms of just uh, success rate, um, as, as you can see here. And here are a couple of the, the skills we have trained on. Um, and this is a large part of our effort is trying to understand exactly um, why this is happening. It's, it's sometimes happening in places that we don't totally expect. For example, we would see the policy be more robust pre-contact. That's not something you would expect. The contact sensors were bringing advantage to. Here's the bottle turning, um, uh, the bottle closing a fastening example again, just to show you in a, on a bigger screen with more uh, pixels. And so the robot is going to pick up that bottle cap. Uh, you know, it's going to carefully align it with the. Uh, opening of the bottle, it does this sort of, uh, what do you call it, this alignment, you know, a strategy to make sure the cap sits carefully. And then it's going to turn this bottle cap with the bubble sensor. And the VIN here is going to undo the, the fastening part. So this part is not in the training data at all. Um, and the policy is able to pick up uh, when the bottle is, is fastened uh, enough and terminate the skill. So, uh, once Naveen stops messing around with the robot, it keeps turning it around. Uh, I think probably one or two more turns. You can see these marks here to tell uh, the bottle cap is actually turning. So the, the robot is going to do a final uh, sort of uh, tiny touch, and then it, it thinks it's uh, sensing enough shared deformations on the bubbles and decided to, to stop the policy there. Okay, so um, I think a lot of things uh, we have shown, we have seen so far, is that these policies maybe you can you can see that there there is some robustness in being into it, but these are actually pretty expensive. Everything we're doing here is maybe an art. It's definitely not magic. It's not like you you show the robot a couple of times, the robot learns how to perform this task robustly. Everything, he, the robustness is coming from the person behind the teleop devices. 
we have learned a way to uh, sort of uh, uh, look at the rollouts, decide what's the likely failure modes and inject data to specifically fix it. The other thing we have been trying to say is that at least for robotics at this current stage, I think data quality matters probably more than quantity. Um, and, and that's probably different from a lot of the, the large uh, model work uh, for images for other things, just because data is so, so expensive for robotics. Um, you can have the same demonstration repeated almost a hundred times, but that's not gonna teach you new things, right? All these robust, uh, robustness is coming from different types of failure modes, different interactions, different scenarios, and in some sense, right, the only way, well, at, for single scales, for, for these single scale scenarios, the only way to cover really bad is you have to show the robot all these things, or at least a couple of them. You know, things could include arrangements of objects, could include initial conditions, background of what the camera sees, views, etc. And there's also a lot of active aspects to it, the interactions between objects, between robot, uh, if the robot misses, what do you, how do you recover, things like that. These are all very expensive uh, things to do. And also it is a, it is an iterative process, right? You can say it is Dagger, but I think uh, it, it's not just Dagger. It's, it's people doing a little bit smarter processing on top of it. Um, and also uh, the way people demonstrate these skills uh, the, the problem solving aspect to it is actually matters quite a lot. And I'm trying to tell you, I'll show you this example. This is the egg beater um, task that we have worked on. This is iteration one. This is the first uh, rollout of that policy. We didn't think it's gonna work, but it actually worked on the first time. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, although it's a little bit shaky, but the robot was able to grab the crank, turn the, the handle and put it down afterwards. Um, this video is very curated. It probably works one up 10 times, as you can imagine for the first uh, rollout. But there are a couple of things wrong with it, right? So let me, let me just do this again. Here, okay, I'm just gonna pause here. So the first thing, very first thing that's wrong, this is a very shiny metal ball. <laughs> Has lots of reflections. You know, everything in the lab, people walking around, you can see it. It's probably not the most you know, data friendly thing to put in the scene. And it's, it also kills all the depth sensors. The other thing you'd look at is this wrist camera. It's looking at the wrong part. This wrist camera is not being useful at all. I can't see the handle. You know, I can't really see what it's grabbing. Uh, it can't see the approach. And also the, the other interesting thing is once the robot puts the handle here, the operator goes straight for the handle. There is no way to recover for this robot. It's basically, if the handle is not there, the robot is just gonna close the gripper and, and keep going. There's no way for the robot to recover. All right, so those are a couple of things that we did wrong. Now, this is the second version we did. Second version, oh yeah, there's one more thing. Um, the mat was totally black, the handles are totally black. So if the handle, you have a black handle on a black mat, you don't really know where the handle is. So we got rid of the black mat, we got rid of the shiny bow, we put a tape here just to make it a little bit visual, more visual. And the wrist camera, now this time, it can actually see where it's grabbing. But still, the problem is uh, still there. You know, this policy is maybe we can get a three out of 10 times working. Um, but the most predominant failure mode is still the handle is not basically within grasp here, the robot wouldn't be able to grasp it. There is not enough room for it to, uh, to try to chase the handle and grasp it. Okay. So this is the third iteration. Uh, it's a bit of a disaster play. Okay. So the robot now, we have added a little bit more data to initial condition changes. Robot can tolerate where things are. It is able to chase things a little bit. So here uh, we've purposefully had the, the, this arm start off further away. So there's enough room for it to do a little bit of adjustment to chase it, to, to grab the handle part. So this is what we have shot in uh, September for our public 
a release thing. Here's one particular failure mode. You know, even though the robot is still able to chase where the handle is, sometimes it still misses it like this. Um, and we didn't have any data to uh, to recover from this particular failure mode. It is this is part of the active uh, recovery strategies. Um, so for Coral, what we did is uh, I try to patch that with more data essentially. So this robot now learns how to push the ball more inside because sometimes uh, people put the, put the ball in, in, a, in a more uh, friendly location. Here, Eric is gonna mess it up more. Now he can turn the handle up, the robot now this time knows how to chase it more properly. Um, it'll do this once and now I'm gonna show it a second time. Robot grasping this. Okay, so this time the, the robot actually did miss the handle again and uh, it turned for a couple of times and decided to re-grasp and, and try to grab the handle again. So the, the main message I'm trying to tell you here is, is again, is, it, is, it is a process, it's not magical. Everything here comes um, with a lot of human intelligence behind it. Here's another example of what we have been doing right now. Um, this is uh, pouring the salad leaves into the, into the bowl part. Um, this is the very first rollout uh, of a train policy. Uh, and it's not working 100% perfectly yet. Um, the first thing I would try to try to address here is maybe have a bag that's a little bit more visually uh, obvious um, and have an easier time for the policy to run. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, single skills, there sometimes if we get lucky, there is a little bit of generalization. So in this case, we've only trained with peeling potato data, and it is able to peel. Uh, a different, uh, what is this, a sweet potato. We've trained it over, I think, a hundred different shaped uh, potatoes we picked up from stars. And here, similarly, uh, it was trained to peel the mini cucumbers and it's able to peel things like, you know, zucchinis and carrots uh, and, and such. But generalization doesn't happen uh, all the time uh, at this point. And, Okay. All right. So the what I want to say here is we are very excited and we think it's time to scale because we have seen enough signs that learning from demonstration is really real in the sense it, it is a very practical approach right now to generate behaviors. For us, it, mo it works mostly out of the box. We didn't have to do a lot of uh, parameter tuning. It was one architecture fix for all the 120 skills we've done. The only thing different is data. Um, it is very accessible, which to me is very important because, you know, um, you don't have to get a, a formal PhD in robotics to program these things uh, anymore. You don't have to call into whatever motion planning libraries. You don't have to know as much. You don't have to know perception at all in some sense, right? Um, there is still a human aspect in it. In, in there. There's still a lot of intelligent part in it. Like the way you design how these uh, interactions between robots and objects are still matters of tremendously. It is a very flexible pipeline. We can do pretty much anything we can, you know, the robot, as long as you can tell you out there, there's a decent chance the robot can learn how to do it. And we're doing it, it in a way to really try to leverage physics. A lot of the compliance a lot of the sort of dirty contacts, you know, extrinsic dexterity, that's all essential to the common sense problem solving part that people do every day. And that's what the robots are starting to learn as well. That to me is extremely important sort of eye opening because I came from like a locomotion you know, background. All we do is put legs here and you know, we don't ever touch anything else. Um, all right, so here's where we are. Um, I think we have learned a, a generic recipe, um, the same thing that works for a lot of different tasks. Um, right now, everything we've learned can be decent, but they are very narrow. They only works in the domain that they're trained on. Anything out of domain, if it works, we'll, it's, it's more luck than anything sort of structured there. And the other thing to me is very interesting is sort of reliability is 
you know, is way bigger than shininess here. Because we're talking about a fleet of robots, we're talking about throughput of data. Uh, and a lot of times it just means uptime for robots. Um, and we really need our systems to be not quite bulletproof yet, but that's where definitely we're trying to go towards. Um, and, and I think a lot of times people ask us what's TRI's specific you know, edge or, or advantage. And I think it's really, we have the expertise to build a very solid platform that can keep up with the demand for the data, for the number of evaluations we need to do uh, and, and such. We, we really know how to, how to do the robotics foundational part well. Cool. Um, last thing I wanna call out is, is actually for me, Personally, I think benchmarking has been a very serious challenge. Um, for, for a lot of RL background people, that might not be the case, right? You just say, yeah, I'm gonna run, I don't know, 10K different rollouts on GPUs and it tells me, it gives me a number and I have a plot. That's not the case for real robots, right? Uh, you have to run this on the robot. And every time you go to the lab, there's the cameras maybe get bumped, your checkpoint is slightly different, you know, the background change a little bit, uh, your potato is moldy now and stuff like that. Everything changes, right? There's nothing you can't set to a fixed initial condition. There is very hard to, to do back and back sort of comparison between different things. Uh, everything is very noisy again and everything takes a hundred times longer. Uh, you know, it, it, it is a, quite a, a serious challenge for us. Okay. Um, and by all of this, I hope to convince you that, you know, we know how to do single skills. We, we can do demos very well nowadays. That's the good part of it. <laughs> now we just need to do a lot more demos and, and hopefully all that data is gonna be uh, useful for us for a bigger thing. Gonna transition to Ben. Yeah, thank you, Siwan. Um, so, you know, I think one of the, the core takeaways from the, the single skill paradigm, one task at a time paradigm, is that we're now in a place where we do have a reliable building block. I think part of the question of scaling for a while has not just been, should we, but also can we? And are we building on a foundation where we understand, you know, are we collecting the right data? Are we, do we have hardware that actually makes sense? Um, and do we have a reasonable confidence that when we get this data, we have something that can actually ingest it? And for all of the limitations, you know, the, the brittleness, the fact that it is um, often not a, a particularly generalizable policy, the fact that we can very reliably get these single skills gives us a, a much more confident place to work from. And it gives us a way to check the data as we're gathering it, make sure that it's feasible for the robot, understand some of the nuances of data quality that matter. And this really kind of guides the direction so that we have a little bit of a map now when we scale. And the other piece is that hopefully it seemed like getting a single skill um, to sort of work in, in a way that would be reliable is tough, like, like you know, very tough. And I think that's, com that's completely true. If you wanted to train one skill at a time and like make a product, so you want a robot that you can put in someone's house and it's gonna do one thing, the amount of data that you need to patch all of those individual bugs, I think is, is quite fast. And you know, not that it isn't doable, but this would be a, a large effort, the sort of thing that you need a team for, you need a lot of money, and you better be pretty sure that that particular business use case that you've picked is the right one, because if you wanted to do something else, you're gonna start over. And that isn't the way that, that sort of robotics is gonna become real or that general purpose robotics is gonna become real. Instead, we need to pull from some of these other fields of machine learning where we start to get a lot of information transfer between different tasks. So you know, in language, the fact that you have a model that understands you know, poetry and also understands legal documents means that you don't need to exhaustively cover you know, every type of diction you might use in your legal document. You wanted to make a legal document that rhymes, that's fine. You can get that sort of transfer. And similarly, we need to have a robot that can pull different attributes from its diverse array of experiences so that you can teach it you know, 20 demonstrations and have confidence that it's gonna do something reasonable even when the lighting changes, even when objects are in a different place, even when there's an obstacle in the way and it needs to go around it, even when something falls and it needs to regress. And so the way that we you know, think we get there, and we've seen some early evidence to support this, is by co-training. So this was the structure of the original policy that we've been using for single task. 
It's fairly straightforward. You condition on observations and you produce a sequence of actions into the future. So right now what we do is we take this and we extend it. So instead of a visual only encoder or visual and proprioception, we also now encode a language prompt. And this is you know, a sentence fragment or a sentence at most, a very short description of, of roughly what the robot should do, stack the mugs, put the bowl in the sink, wipe the counter, that sort of thing. But now what that means is we can train this single denoiser and these, these single observation encoders to do different tasks. We'll just aggregate our data. And then during training, you just condition on the appropriate prompt and the rest of the supervised paradigm can essentially stay as is. And uh, one more design detail that I will share here is at the moment we're using a joint visual language encoder here, something called I may have touched the wrong thing, one moment. I think actually my slides had a, cat, had a catastrophic error, one second. Questions. Sorry, folks. One moment. Yeah, this one. We're not. Um, we didn't do. It was it was a design choice made for sort of more than anything. Does uh, this have to run in real time now? I forgot to mention it's going to run faster than ten hertz. It not be those twenty hertz sometimes, ten hertz depending on the camera we see it at some time. And also, if we have space as part of the output, it makes the sort of the training aspect much harder. Because now we have to deal with images uh, creation in some sense, or maybe we have to be outputs in later space. It's not doable, um, but at, at a cost. You know, there is, it's not obvious to me that those were the right things to do. Then the easier for it just to come out straight from Okay, I think we're back. Apologies for that. Um, so yes, essentially uh, we can now train these, these joint policies with data aggregated from across all of our skills. And um, we're using a, a Voltron model. So that's a joint um, visual and language encoder. And we still condition on several frames in the past and then constant across all of the time steps of a rollout, it's that same conditioning prompt. So you're sort of reminding the, the policy every single time step, hey, this is still, you know, you're still stacking the, the, the bowls for instance. And an important caveat before I kind of talk about some of the, the early results in this area is that by design, this multitask formulation absorbs more data. So I'm gonna show you some comparisons of a single task policy and a multitask policy. And the multitask policy is cheating. It has access to a lot more samples from all of the other um, skills that the robot's been taught. And that's by design, right? Because really we want a system that's able to absorb large volumes of, of this data, but just keep in mind, again, there's no magic here. Uh, the reason you're going to see some performance differences is that we're absorbing more data with this approach. So here's an example of a, of a single skill policy that we have. And like Siwan mentioned, uh, evaluation can be a bit tricky. And one of the ways that it's tricky is sometimes you hit one of the scene cameras with your head and it moves a bit. And when that happens, um, if you're not very careful at putting it back, it's pretty easy to break these single skill policies. And in this case, that's exactly what happened. Um, so here in this example, we took the same training data and we mixed it with data from 14 other skills and with the camera still bumped. So the example it had of stacking bowls was with some other camera configuration, but inside that training data of those skills are a few different camera bumps. So now the robot has seen examples of the world with cameras in a few different positions. And you see that we've transferred a little bit of robustness. So now we're doing a skill with a visual viewpoint that the robot has never seen before for that particular skill. There's another example I'm gonna show you, which is basically changing distribution by inducing some clutter. 
So here on the left, you can see that what the sort of in distribution scene is. And on the right, the scene is not that different. There's a few more objects um, and, and you know, there's some novel things that's never been seen, but this particular policy was, was fairly brittle. Um, it turns out to, to you know, distractors in the environment. And so you know, this was sort of a reasonably out of distribution scenario. And with this kind of distribution shift, what we generally see is that if you do evaluation in the same initial conditions that you trained in, doesn't matter so much at this point whether you've trained for one policy at a time or many at once, which kind of makes sense. If your, if your test distribution matches your training distribution, that's a reasonable place to be. But when we shift to an out of distribution scenario, these larger policies are losing significantly less performance. And so here you can see a single task and then a policy trained by um, amalgamating data from 16 tasks and then 50. And fairly consistently, again, this is still early, so you know, please, please grains of salt, but pretty consistently across all, all the experiments that we've done, we've seen pointers in this direction that even at pretty moderate scale, right? This is not internet scale at all. You do start to get some of these early signs of transfer. And this is mostly visual generalization. So I'll talk about that a little later, but yeah. This is, this is where the difficulty of robot benchmarking comes in. Essentially, you're looking at noise. So, so you know, there's a little bit of per run variance still because you don't have an exact distribution. I wouldn't read too much into this. Most of the other experiments that we've done don't show this. You know, you show kind of a, a moderate um, improvement, you know, compared to, to single task, but you don't get better out of distribution. In, in this case, what you're seeing is the multitask policy basically doesn't treat this as distribution shift. So it's, it's essentially the same from the policy perspective. And we got maybe a little unlucky on the in-distribution results. You can see the 50 policy is doing worse. I think we had a few unlucky rollouts and then maybe we were a little luckier in the other case. We have. Um, it hasn't appeared that we're capacity, particularly capacity limited yet. Um, I, I think certainly we've needed to go a little bit bigger than the single task policies, just moving to a larger encoder is, is sort of how we do things. And the, the denoiser is a bit bigger, but separate from scaling up to a few hundred million parameters, we haven't seen a significant benefit from say going to from 400 million to 800 million yet. I, I expect we'll get there. But for right now, for most of this work, we're in the several hundred million parameter range. And it seems like the data is the bottleneck, not the model capacity. Here's another example that's kind of cute. So this is a sort of more extreme version. So this is, uh, just very simple, pick up the, the cup full of ice and pour it in the sink. Here's a training example. Uh, all the training uh, runs for this were completely clean. So like the mug is the only thing um, it sees in the world for, for these. And the single task policy just catastrophically breaks when you introduce a lot of clutter. The multitask policy has actually never seen this level of clutter before. It's seen some of these objects. For other skills, it's seen you know, on the order of three or four objects. But actually, we, we've gotten enough visual robustness out of it that we can get a little excited here. And we can do something that's actually out of the training data for any of the skills um, that the, the multitask was training, trained on. And so you see just a little bit of extrapolation. Um, here's a, another kind of qualitative comparison. So, so one thing that we've seen as well, the motions that we get out of these multitask policies um, often appear to be a little bit smoother. And, it's interesting even, it's, it's a little bit independent of the particular task. It just seems like you, you started to learn a little bit more of a prior over like what reasonable motion is. Another thing that's been good to see is the, the policies do appear to pay attention to language conditioning. So in this example, uh, all of the objects in the, in the scene represent other tasks like by design that we put in the training distribution. So it's ambiguous without language, you could do like five or six different things that the network was trained on. And pretty reliably in this scenario, it'll actually do the thing that you prompt for. So that's a good sanity check as well. And then we also see flickers of sort of slightly more reasonable recovery behavior. I wouldn't say it's emergent yet, but for instance, in this example, it's, it's generalizing um, much more than the, the single task policy to things that require to reach towards the edge of the workspace. So the single task version of this, um, struggles, you know, if something goes flying towards the edge like that, it's, it's, it's quite hesitant. And the multitask policy, um, you know, by transferring from other skills is able to sort of bring that over. So in the last couple of minutes here, um, 
I want to come back to talking about large behavior models, which was sort of the original title of the talk. So nothing that you saw here yet was a large behavior model. They don't exist. Um, no one has shown the sort of emergent physical capabilities yet. But I think the proof of life that we've seen at the single scale and now at the sort of moderate scale multitask setting uh, really puts this into the, into the realm of a reasonable target. And I think it's not overly optimistic to say that I think in 2024, there's a good shot of getting some of these properties that we associate with other large models in the realm of physical behavior. And so as we said at the beginning, to support this, we're scaling our physical data collect, targeting over a thousand skills by the end of next year. But that really isn't gonna be enough. Uh, I think the, while the scaling laws are uncertain, it's pretty clear that a thousand skills alone is not the amount of data that you need to really get the kind of general purpose capabilities we want. So an important part of, uh, of sort of moving from somewhat generalizable model for behavior to actually a large, lar you know, true large model is gonna be taking other sources of data. So we've seen you know, OpenX embodiment and some very exciting projects this year amalgamating different sources of embodied robot data. I think that's a very important piece of the puzzle. Um, I think simulation has a huge role to play. So at the beginning of the presentation, we showed you the Drake version of our physical station that exists in simulation. And while simulation can't yet simulate everything that you can do in reality with perfect fidelity, it can do a lot. And these tools are getting better every year. And the fact that we have this now in our, in our toolbox means that we don't necessarily need to learn everything from real data. And so I, I think there's a really crucial role for SIM to play in that data mixture. This is the disadvantage of having too much video. I'm gonna leave it um, here visually because the, the remainder of the talk, I think is, is we can just do here instead of wasting time. Um, I think the other source of data that is huge and is an elephant in the room is pulling from internet scale data. And we've seen examples this year of things like RT2. So being able to take pre-trained models and pull semantic information out of them, that's good. I think that's an important piece of the puzzle, but a huge open question is how do we unlock physical transfer? And it's our belief that there's a certain amount of embodied physical data that is probably required in order to get grounding from things like video things like internet data sources into robot action. So I don't know that we need to go all the way from you know, zero to fully general robot with physical data. We just need enough to unlock transfer from these other sources of data. And on that note, the, the sort of final takeaway is that I think there's, there's kind of three big general questions on our radar, especially for this next year that, that matter a lot. Um, one of them I think is paying attention to how we represent the world or how we represent observations. I know Leslie gave a talk pretty recently at the seminar that, that touched on this in much more detail, but I wholeheartedly second it. I think conditioning on a fraction of a second um, of observation history, first of all, is not enough to perform many complicated tasks, but I think it's also not enough to learn some of the general properties about the world that we need to learn. And it's not clear that sort of naive autoregression on history is gonna go the distance for embodiment. The second thing on our radar is source of supervision signal. So we can take inspiration from language. We can take inspiration from what people are doing in video. But robots are still a little different. And one of the key differences is that the world is underactuated from the perspective of the robot in all but the most trivial cases. So the actions that you predict are not the observations that you're going to observe at the next time step. And there's a big space of design choices that we need to experiment with and, and understand that don't exist, for instance, in language. And I think there's a huge opportunity there. And the final thing is, you know, it sounds a little bit mundane, but there's just huge questions, like I said at the beginning, about what good data means. We can look at single skills and we can understand, okay, what's required to make a single skill work. It's not totally clear that all of those attributes uh, overlap with the attributes you want in this larger data set. So we talk about a robot curriculum. We talk about creating um, basically a, a set of examples that will teach robots sort of foundational properties that get transferred. But it may be that very hard examples are useful there. So just because you've, you've failed to teach a single skill reliably, maybe that means that the skill is performed poorly, or maybe it means that that's a really hard problem and it's really important to have that data in the robots training set. And uh, I expect that again, this year, as we finally start to get into another step of scale, uh, 
the field as a whole is going to be in a place to start answering some of those questions because I think truthfully right now it, it looks a little murky. I think we're at time maybe and then some so I'll end there. Apologies for the technical trouble but if we can go over a little bit it would be great to, to do some questions. Okay, so the policy outputs, sorry, the policy outputs, whatever it's going to output. But the good thing about diffusion is like, it's most of the time going to be uh, very much in distribution of whatever you showed it. So that's one benefit of diffusion over MLPs, let's just say. The other thing is we, everything the policy outputs, we run it through a QP controller um, on our robot. So. In that particular controller, we have baked in a lot of the model-based goodness. It's not going to run into the table. It's not going to run into itself. It's going to obey torque limits. It's not going to accelerate incredibly fast, right? It's it's going to do the sensible thing on for a robot. Um, that's also very important for teleop actually, because people outputs whatever they want, <laughs> and a lot of times the robot can't keep up. The, so we have find a very good implementation of the mid-level controller P to be a, a critical aspect of the entire sort of a, a pipeline platform. It is very, very important. Thanks. Hey, you. Uh, that is an excellent question. Yeah. So um, I think the, the short version is how to do this sort of really well or really rigorously is an open question. Um, we have simple ways that, that we do it, but I, I think I'd prefer to not get into those details here, not really because they're particularly like proprietary, but just, I, I don't think we have kind of a fundamental, here's the thing everybody should do answer for you yet. Yeah, the, the short answer to that is we are looking at relativity again. So, so in that sense, we don't have to align things accordingly. In the diffusion plan, everything we do there was uh, sort of absolute. We try to do relatives again, and if, you know, if given more uh, uh, data, actually, it seems to be more reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. Um. That's a great question. The short answer is no. Um, the slightly longer answer is it's not totally clear what role kind of explicit out of distribution detection is gonna play. I think that there's a few competing schools of thought. One is that you wanna do this very explicitly. And when you, you know, see that you're getting out of distribution, either take corrective action or, or stop. I think there's a kind of separate approach that, that may get us there as well though, which is actually leaning into to sort of other sources of supervision. And, and specifically, I think we have the ability to say bootstrap on other pre-trained models that are, are getting better kind of by the month at understanding images and understanding video. And so a, a different paradigm is I think having um, notions of, of uncertainty or potentially even safety at some point be an ad hoc kind of a process, or you can imagine having a monitor or having another model um, that, that is sort of reasoning about what the robot sees. And if that model is trained on, on a, a different pool of data or a broader pool of data, uh, potentially it's not out of distribution just because your policy is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. We, so um, it is pre-trained. So, so Voltron is, is pre-trained on um, text and image data. We found that, that pre-training you have to be a little careful with. So for a while, uh, we actually were seeing basically no benefit from pre-training. Um, it turns out, I think we were using not quite the right models. I think the, the sort of alignment between a lot of perception tasks and the things important for behavior is not trivially high. Um, with with Voltron, for instance, I think with, with some other um, embeddings that people are using these days, there does actually seem to be a little bit of a robustness improvement, especially to visual distractors. 
It's still very critical in our experience to fine tune through these though. If you, if you have a pre-trained feature extractor and you freeze it, basically the policy doesn't work or you know, the, a very large percentage of the time, everything appears to be totally broken. So there's still enough of a kind of misalignment between those two things that you do want to fine tune through. Yeah, so we're not doing a ton of image augs right now. I think the, the normal sort of uh, RGB space color jittery and a little bit random crop and sometimes random locations a little bit. Nothing, nothing too substantial there. Um, in a sense, we are not totally happy with the way we're treating images right now. Like I think um, it is very, it is like the view is so baked into these policies right now. So every time you bump the camera, you change the view, it's not gonna work very well. One solution is you just feed it 100 million times more data and sometimes maybe it works. But I think there is probably a more structured way to do this. I think um, looking at something, you know, in terms of feature space, that's something explicitly more in the, in the 3D reasoning aspect is probably you know, give us more mileage there. And, um, if that makes sense. And there's been a few works this year in that direction too. I, I think it's very promising, you know, Act 3D just to pick one of, of multiple. Um, but yeah, I, I think combining your observations in a, a slightly more carefully thought out space, at least for a while until we have the internet, you know, uh, of robot data makes a lot of sense. So for single task, just because the way people demonstrate it, most of the time, people are very good at funneling things towards whatever is coming out of the funnel. Right? A lot of the times, the end goal state is very unimodal in some sense. Um, we haven't tried a lot of tasks that has a natural kind of controlled different end goal state um, just yet. But that, that is an interesting um, thing to, but, it, it, if, but if you look at multitask setting, that's definitely coming up because the robot will do different things if you tell it to do different things and it will do different things. I think there was a question over there. Um, we, multimodality in terms of embodiment is a little bit tricky. I think there, it, it feels currently like there's kind of this cliff where if you have one embodiment, like exactly one embodiment, it works great. And, you know, I think we have strong reason to believe just from the way generalization works in other areas that with enough randomization and diversity, also it will work pretty well. And there's this very awkward middle ground in the middle we're having like exactly two embodiments or like three embodiments in your training data is kind of tricky. We've definitely seen sensitivity to embodiment change. So changing the viewpoint on the camera, you can think of that as a type of embodiment shift. Um, our stations are also adjustable. So you can move the robot arms, you can change the height of the table. And when you co-train these policies, actually we've seen a little bit more robustness. So one example we did was we adjusted the Z height of the table and the um, 15 task policy that we were using in, in this case was able to compensate for, you know, it's, it's lower by like an inch and a half, whereas the single task version that was really baked in. But all of this stuff I think is, is going to be a little bit limited until we really lean into diversity in the training data. And I think that's where simulation has potentially a huge role to play because it's very hard to randomize your embodiment in hardware. Like I said, just in infrastructure and logistics wise difficult, but in SIM it's, it's like almost free. And so I think there's a huge amount of promise there. Yeah, also, the, if you ask an embodiment question, I think the harder one is probably, for example, you get a lot of demonstration data from people. You want to clone that data and, and, and map it, retarget it to, people, to robots. And between robots, I feel, again, we probably, we probably know how to do it through math. Uh, we don't necessarily have to do it through data just yet. But if it's people to robots, I think that 
was a question about, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so for, let me ask the second part, since it's gonna be quicker. The, um, it, it is a short sentence language description. Um, in, in training, we actually take that short, uh, whatever language description, and you feed it to each GP and say, give me 15 more variants of the same thing. So that's the sort of data arc on the, on the language aspect. You get more variety in, in terms of the uh, features. Uh, so for how do we define a scale? I think that's a very good question. Um, a lot of times right now, uh, we would treat two different skills that could be the same skill as separate things, uh, depending on different views of it. We could be pouring different things into the bowl. We could treat that as one skill. We could pour a, a second or third ingredient into the same bowl. And sometimes we call it a, a different skill, sometimes not. I think. Overall, I guess the, the skill boundary is going to be less and less sharp uh, if we have more fine grained things like language descriptions on it. But I think there, there is going to be a fine line between where, where you are on it. I mean, like it, to some extent, you can, you can have like a general grab skill. And that solves like 98% of robotics or manipulation, not, not quite that. But. Um, but maybe that's just too hard to, to learn, right? Maybe you actually want to chop it down into some kind of approach, use a little bit of alignment, you want to touch it, you want to feel if you have the grasp, if it's form closed, you know, closure. Do you want to break down to that granularity? It's not It's not 100% clear to me, but it is, it is definitely a way to do it, right? We have a next group coming in. Okay. Probably All right. Room, but I think you guys can Yeah, we got to probably get out. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah.